Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. I'm the CEO of Rue Global Impact, and I'm really excited about our guest today. I was teasing her before we came on air saying that I was going to need the rest of the afternoon and maybe all day tomorrow too to talk about this topic because this is a very important topic and certainly very relevant to what we're all living right now during the COVID-19 crisis. And the topic is about grief. So my guest today is Dr. Um, Patty Ashley, and she is a best-selling author, international speaker, and a psychotherapist. She has a new book that just came out, and it's for it's for the uh, professionals, mental health professionals. It's Shame Informed Therapy, and she has a, um, another book called Letters to Freedom: From Fear to Love to Grace. Love that title, Patty. And then her first book, which was actually part of her dissertation of becoming. Um, a doctor, congratulations, um, is living in the shadows of, a, of two good mother architects. So, um, and as I always say, as authors, it's so important when you, you know, certainly buy the books help, but leaving reviews, especially good reviews. Uh, we don't like the bad reviews, but she, she's a wonderful, talented um, author. And uh, I'm really looking forward to talk, talking about these very, very important topics today. So Patty, welcome to the program. Hi, Deborah. Thanks so much for having me today. So, Penny, tell us a little bit more about your work. It's it's very interesting, and you you go in some directions I'm not seeing others go in as much, but it feels powerful, especially in the times we're in right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are definitely in a time of collective grief right now, and my work really evolved from my experience of losing my father when I was 11. I'll just go straight to the the heart of, of of my how I got to where I am. Um, 11 years old, sudden heart attack. Nobody really wanted to talk about it because we just didn't talk about grief. We just, you know, back in the day and still a lot today, it's let's get over it. Let's move on. Let's get through it. And, and having been raised Catholic, there was another element of, um, you know, in the Catholic faith, you believe that you've gone gotten to the promised land, you know, when you die, it's supposed to be like better out there. And so that was the myth that I was told and I didn't buy it, but didn't know what to do at 11. And so at, as a teen, I decided I wanted to be a psychologist, but I wasn't doing so great in school because I was a little depressed from having grief going on that I didn't know what to do with. So the guidance counselor told me I wasn't smart enough to be a psychologist. Of course. So. Of course. Yeah. Yes, of course you were told that. Oh, how sad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So my career path took a wind, took some winding turns, but they were all helpful in terms of bringing me to where I am today. Um, and, you know, it's still my heart is really with grief and helping people understand grief and giving them a place um, to talk about things. That, that's what I, you know, when I was a teen said, I want to give people a place to talk about things that seem really hard to talk about. So I was a special education teacher and then a parent educator, and then I got licensed here in Colorado uh, 21 years ago. So I've put together all the work that I've done in these various you know, arenas, and it really helps inform my work as a therapist. Yeah. And, and I, I love that you were a special education teacher. I know I'll, we talk a lot on the show about inclusion of people with disabilities and trying to reduce um, the societal barriers associated with that, that some people are less important than other people. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a shame when our counselors, I, I've had counselors do that to me as well. I had a teacher tell me I was a terrible writer and I should definitely not ever be in the, uh, a business where I had to write. And, and it stuck with me so long, still, still yeah. that voice will play in my head. And um, they become great teachers but they also are abusers at, at the same time and i think they forget what their role is so um and i think you're a perfect example of that so yeah. i'm glad you did well, not listen and i talk a lot about that in my new book shame informed therapy on how these messages get it set up in our body memory and we believe they're true especially under the age of seven all the messages that we're told kind of get 
absorbed in our body memory and then we are go unconscious in terms of you know the awareness of them so that's what shame informed therapy is all about and yeah that's another example even in high school being told that so of course you know yeah. I'm not smart it enough. sticks with you right it sticks with you because i think a lot of us worry that we're not smart enough we're not pretty enough we're not enough 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 and so i i know when my mother died and my mother was very ill and she was ready to go and um the grief surprised me and because i almost thought i would be relieved mm -hmm. and i i did i know um doug frost my producer he he held my hand during it but i remember seven days after she died I was feeling a lot better and I called Duck up and I, I said, well, sh done with that. Okay. So and he just laughed and he's like, okay. All right, Deborah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're feeling good today. But then of course I proceeded to have months and months and still, still uh, struggle with it. But, and now Patty, we're losing our loved ones and we can't visit them in the hospital and we can't be there with them. And, and I, I just, I, I I think about as sometime as someone that has you know my my life partner my husband um, I worry about his health and you know and and I my daughter and all of us and so Patty what in the world where do we even go with this and why why do we not talk about grief and death in ways I I can't even I my heart hurts for you being an 11 year old child and losing your father and then nobody really knows how to help you navigate it but it's okay patty he's in a better place right well i don't know how helpful that is to you right. but right well it set me off on this spiritual quest to find god and, and actually you know what i found is that we're not supposed to really know it's all a mystery but that took me many years to figure out but you know yeah and i there's always the purpose for the pain i mean studies of resiliency show that people who are able to give back and so every day i do this work and i i'm grateful um because of the empathy that i have around grief and i think that's really where the good work happens is in the empathy um yeah well said well said and the yes the sadness about oh my gosh my heart is so heavy these days um because i feel the collective grief i i when i whenever i feel those stories that you just described you know and i see a loved one in the hospital, you know, on the news and the um, family members outside a window or whatever. I, I, it's unbearable, isn't it? It's really unbearable. It is. It is. And you can feel it. it, it I, I have an, um, a team member that's in the Philippines and she, um, she sent me a message the other day and she said, I'm really struggling with anxiety and I'm, I'm so, I just am nervous and scared. And, and she said, and, and I don't understand because things are, they're going okay. You know, I'm safe. And, and she was just really struggling. And, and I said, just know we all are, we all are. So you might not know, maybe other people are better at hiding it, but we're all experiencing the, these intense, intense energies right now. I'm hopeful that we're experiencing this because we're going to learn to be more evolved compassionate, empathetic human beings to each other. And some of the stuff that has gone on in our country and all over the world, I think we, we can do much, much, much better. Mm -hmm. um, but Patty, let's talk a little bit about the stages of grief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elizabeth Kulbaras um, worked with terminally ill patients for a long time and, and discovered that there were these stages of grief that most people experienced when they were um, losing a loved one. And it's, um, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you what they are and then I'll give you more detail. Denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and acceptance. And they're not linear and that's the thing. I mean, we live in a world where we like things to be li logical and linear. We want the ABCs and the one, two, threes and the bullet points and we wanna check off our list and be good. So I think it's really important to mention that grief isn't linear as neither are our emotion is our emotional self, which is why we've kind of feared our emotions because they're kind of like hard to pin down, you know, our logic, we can, again, one, two, three, ABC. Um, so they're not linear, but, and we can move in and out of them over a period of time and there's no time length. I mean, the average is two to three years, but you know, and then more grief comes up and activates old grief because because the body doesn't have any time. And so that's a lot of what we're in right now. 
um, is old grief is coming up. Not, not that we don't have enough grief going on present day. We also have the body memory of the, of the older grief that maybe we haven't moved through. So let's talk about each one a little bit. There's um, denial. It's kind of like when you're in a car accident and you've had a major, you know, your leg is broken or whatever. You don't necessarily feel it because the body goes into shock. It's the same thing with grief. It's like, um, it's too intense. So the body has a, a, a mechanism that's able to shut it out. And, um, and I'll tell you a story. I haven't really said this much lately, but when my father died, I didn't cry in the funeral and I felt so ashamed. So grief and shame to me are really good friends. They, you know, I'm realizing that, um, they really are woven together in a lot of ways, but I felt I, I literally could not cry at his funeral. And it wasn't till I started my own work in therapy and my own studying um, in my master's in early childhood that I realized I was in denial. I was in the denial part and I couldn't, I mean, that was intense to, uh, you know, lose your father suddenly. And then the funeral's like three days later. Um, right. You're in shock. You're in shock. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, but I felt so much shame. Like what's wrong with me? I can't cry at my father's funeral. So it was such a relief when I, uh, I understood the stages of grief. I went, Oh, no wonder. That's why. Um, it was normal, maybe. It was normal. And then the bargaining. And this is where we're, we think, you know, what did I do wrong? Could I have done something? You know, could I have saved my father? And especially as kids. Kids tend to really always have this, it's a healthy narcissism, they call it, where, you know, because all they know is their own world. And so whatever happens around them, they, they, they wonder what they did wrong. Um, it's just a normal thing and bargaining. And so then we turn it, you know, we can turn that inward as an adult bargaining it, you know, you can see how that shows up, you know, did I do enough? Um, um, you know, well, uh, like you were saying about your mom, you know, sometimes when older people die, there's this idea that, well, that they've lived a good life, you know, right. why am I upset about, um, uh, I've just lost you guys. Hang on. Let me get your screen back. <laughs> oh my goodness. My technology skills. Uh, I think we're all learning technology during this time. There we are. Sorry about that. Oh um, no, no, it happens. I had a, a call coming in. I'm going to turn my phone off and then <laughs> my computer, blah, blah, blah. Technology. So bargaining. Um, yeah. So all these questions of, you know, the, the, they're old, they should be dying, but why, so why am I grieving? And, and then how long? And in, in a week, I'm good, you know? And so we- I'm dying, because that was really painful. <laughs> oh. It is so painful. <laughs> it's so and, painful. Yeah, and then the anger comes up, and sometimes it's hard um, to be angry at people for dying. I know that that was a hard one for me, you know, because my dad's in heaven and, and la, la, la. Um, and so- and he's so happy, Patty. Why would you not want him to be happy? Exactly. Because he's my dad. I want him here. So, sorry. Yeah. So the anger, but anger is a, what we've learned is that, you know, feelings and behavior are two different things, but it wasn't until the last century when we started researching child development and human behavior. Um, I always say we're the only species that has to research ourselves to understand how to get along with each other. <laughs> We did it pretty. We did it pretty bad for years, but it was really more about survival, you know, because lifespans were shorter and we didn't have the medical technology that we have now. So we're living longer. And one of my instructors had said we have the luxury of really looking at our emotional self. So what we've learned about feelings, my favorite line is, "All feelings are okay, but all behavior isn't." So the feeling of anger itself is 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 energizing and helps give us clues when we try and not be angry and shut our feelings down, that's when it turns into something else or when we act out our feelings and just get mad at people because we're, you know, lashing out, that's not effective, but we want to pay attention to the anger that comes up with the grief because it helps move us. It, it energizes, it helps create distance. It, and it's good to be mad because it moves the energy. We want to get the energy. We want to get through the energy of grief. We can't go around it. And the anger kind of moves the energy out of our body a little bit. Which is interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. 
to writing letters. I there was a one of my old TV shows, Thirty um, Something, back in the day. Hopefully, they're they're saying they're going to come back with it be Sixty Something now. <laughs> really, <laughs> um, there was a scene where they go to the airport and they lay on the hood of a car, and and when the airplanes go by, they just scream. You know, yeah, so there's yeah. a healthy way to release anger. You know, anything, you know, there are scream rooms in the hospitals, some hospitals now for people who've lost people in, you know, car accidents, you know, sudden um, acute loss just to scream. So it, so there's, there's uh, a value to anger um, as long as it's effect. Uh, you, you know, we have a safe container and then we move into depression and that's what a lot of us are in right now just kind of a heaviness you know and i love michelle obama when i don't know if you saw that and she i did i the- did and i hung on every gosh and she said i'm i ha- i would say i'm going through a low grade depression and everybody was like oh my gosh is she okay you know um oh she's right. depressed you know and i even had a client yesterday um talk about grief um she's a college kid and talk about the college kids and the grief around not being able to or even this you know there's grief so many layers of grief but her grief right now is you know school isn't exactly the same she's a junior in college and she also, we pulled up some old grief of when her grandmother died. Her grandmother was her caretaker most of her childhood while her parents worked. And she died when she was like in fifth or sixth grade. And so there's a lot of old grief there. Anyway, she said to me yesterday, she goes, you know, I think I'm depressed again. <laughs> yeah. And I said, of course you are. I said, but let me tell you what I think about depression. I, I'll put it in a little box over here, like, I'm depressed, you know, and that's kind of what we do in our culture is we, we want to put things in a box and, and check, or is it good or is it bad? And it's always both and, cause it teaches us, right? When we're sad, just like the anger, it teaches us. So anyway, I said, here's what I feel, how I believe depressed. One of my teachers said all depression is unresolved grief. Um, and not, not all my colleagues would agree with me, but I operate under that belief. And so there's always some grief underneath. And so to give ourselves permission to be sad, that's the hard part. We're so afraid we're going to be sad forever when we're sad that we want to hurry up and get out of it. But sometimes we just need to be sad. It hurts being there. Yeah, it hurts being there, Patty. So we want to run away from it and not do the work to get out of it. Exactly. And you can't go around it. You have to go through it. And that is why I do the work I do, because I feel like we need people to guide us through that and help us tolerate the discomfort. I think we're seeing a lot of that with the kids today and families. I also do some work with my daughter, you know, on parent coaching moms in real life is our program that we do together. And she's a cool psychologist who um, has two little ones, a seven and a three year old. And so she's working at doing the working at home, homeschooling, the whole thing so she's in the thick of it and so we've had some really great conversations and we put together a course on that um but what i think is coming up with that is this tolerating being able to tolerate discomfort and i think we've lived in kind of an overindulgence for a while which is again my first book the shadow of the two good mother wanting to give our kids everything wanting to overcompensate for what we know we didn't have so we over give over give over give and then we you know raise kids that feel entitled to whatever they want but in the world's not like that and now i think we have a big wake-up call that oh gosh <laughs> we have to tolerate hard things sometimes because that's part of living on planet earth Right. And so it's it's kind of it it's an invitation to parents, and it's also hard because it's not anything we've done before. Back back to the stages of grief, you know. So we're in this depression, and we're feeling sad. And yeah, you know, honestly, my opinion. I have a lot of opinions, but my opinion is we talk about the increase in suicides um, and mental health issues. I think it's because we don't give permission, people permission to be sad. And so then they turn it inward and think, what's wrong with me? I can't get out of the sad. And it's really, you know, if you let people be sad, then the sad goes away. I always tell one of my favorite stories. When my daughter was about three or four years old and she was very emotional. I have four children and she's my emotional one of the four. They're all emotional in some way, but she's, you know, anyway, she was crying hysterically. I don't know what it was about, but my mom said, 
you know, Laura, you're so much prettier when you're not crying. Of course, old school, you know, that was right, right, right. way of stop crying before I give you something to cry about. And I was studying with my mentor, Catherine Kersey, early childhood at Old Dominion University. You you may even know yeah. her. Thing. And, yes, uh, I do. I do. Yeah. I have heard of her. I've heard her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm, oh, she's... Mm. Anyway, the first interview I've had who knows my mentor, who was such a dear, dear, dear soul. She has Alzheimer's right now, which is great. Anyway, she, yeah, yeah, she, um, I was studying with her at the time and I was studying all feelings are okay, but all behavior isn't and helping to validate. And so what I said to my mom is I said, um, mom, she'll stop crying when she's ready. And so when my mom had said, you're so much prettier when you're not crying, her, her tears and crying escalated to extreme wails. When I said she'll stop when she's ready, she stopped like that because I gave her permission to feel. And when she was, my mom was trying to talk her out of her feelings, which is what a lot of the old school beliefs are all about and like I said it wasn't until the mid 20th century that we started going oh well, that wasn't that's such a great idea yeah maybe we shouldn't have done that right yeah but we're still trying to clean it all up because it's in our body memory it's in our DNA so mm-hmm. depression and then acceptance so that was a, a, a lot of a lot of extra pieces in all the stages of grief but except but important they're they're just all so important and also Patty I believe this is correct we we don't just as you said go through them linearly you know it's like you could actually it's like because i remember walking my grief just with my mom and it and i was got to anger and i thought oh good i only have and then all of a sudden i was back into the old and i'm thinking wait a minute i don't i shouldn't have to go back to one i'm on three <laughs> <laughs> you will let it get me uh <laughs> Yeah. 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 And that's what we do. We, it, it's, it's a way we try and feel emotionally safe, which is also what I write about in the shame book is how our brain develops and starts to create these stories, you know, and we, we think, and then we grow up and we think that we can logically um, manage our emotional self when it isn't logical at all. So it's a whole other somatic experience uh, and allowing and permission and feeling and being and tolerating that we haven't really learned how to do well. No, and we don't accept it in society. We don't allow people to do it. I know in the past, you know, people would mourn for a year. Yeah. They wouldn't go out. I mean, and so we, it felt like we honored it a little bit more in the past, but I want to make a few comments and I want to ask you a question. And I remember Marianne Williams and I've been following her work for so many years. And when I was a young woman, I read, she, I, I was listening to her and she said a friend of hers went through a traumatic experience. I don't remember what it was. And the woman said, well, you know, I went to the doctor and I got some um, prescription medication to help me because otherwise, Marianne, I would have been like in bed for like a week sobbing. And Marianne said, yeah, so what's wrong with that? Get in bed and sob for a week. Allow and I, I remember thinking, oh, well, we could actually honor our feelings. I, I thought that was important. But I also wanted to say that one thing that I found when I, and I, I've lost other people. My mom just, I had a very interesting relationship with my mother. And um, I was with her the day she died, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was a very intense experience for me. But one thing that I remember being surprised about it almost felt like I was having withdrawal symptoms when my mom died. I did not expect that. And I've never heard anybody talk about it. Of course you did with your father, but is that, I, I was just, I just wanted to ask you about that. You mean I, physiological? Yeah, it almost felt like I was having withdrawal symptoms of my mother's energy not being here anymore with me. I was com- very confused by it. Well, a couple yeah, maybe that's just how I interpreted it, but it's about word. You know, uh, Peter Levine in, in, in one of his newer books, oh, I think, oh, there it is, In an Unspoken Voice, he, he, he talks about how he witnessed someone, oh, I think it was a pedestrian that got hit by a car, 
And he went over to her while they were waiting for the ambulance and he held her while she was shaking. And so he talks about in trauma how it's normal and healthy for the body to shake. So I'm wondering if that's kind of what, you know, you're experiencing because grief is a trauma, whether it's a sudden death or, you know, I think the, it's a way, it's a way that the body actually, again, moves the energy. And so what do we do? We give them an injection of something to stop the shaking, right? Which I'm not saying that's good or bad. And I'm not saying medication is good or bad, but I want to go back to Marianne Williamson because I think it was her book, Tears to Triumph, from Tears to Triumph, where she, she, I think I read that in there (sighs) and sigh of relief for that for that very reason. And again, that's exactly what I'm talking about is how do we help witness people through that? My, I have a big dream, but very little money in the bank. So if there's any big investors out there, <laughs> let me know. But I did. I, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. It's, I'm really praying for this one because especially in light of this conversation. So fast forward in my life from 11 to my late fifties, when I lose my fiance, um, the same way that I lost my father. So he, they both, both had heart attacks on the living room floor and, um, yeah. And so I wrote my, thank you. So I wrote my book letters to freedom from fear to love to grace because I was in, in such awe, you know, I'm going to use the word awe here of what had happened because he was such a dear heart and such an important person in my own personal healing um, in, in terms of his availability and relationship, like I'd never had before. And, um, so to lose him suddenly that way, I felt like I knew he was going to help me continue to heal from losing my dad, but I didn't think it would be this way. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a hard way to do it. <laughs> yeah. So what ever since we were actually trying to create a retreat center for people, he worked in the field of addiction and we wanted to create a retreat center for people who are struggling with like codependency or, and, you know, the softer addictions um, that we don't necessarily talk as much about like we do with drugs and alcohol. And after he died, I thought, you know what, I want to, I want to continue our dream. And I think it may be more one about a retreat center for people to go, a place for people to go to grieve. Cause I really want, and this is my vision is three months. I don't know why three months just came to me. A place where people can go they don't have to worry about anything for three months and they can be in nature and they can um, meet with supportive therapists and, and counselors and they can do you know talk about their dreams I do dream work they can talk about um, they can paint there's art and there's just ways to be with the grief there's wailing rooms there's you know all, a place where people can go and grieve for three months and not feel ashamed that they're doing what you were, you know, describing Marianne Williamson said to do. Um, Because again, we have this idea that if we go there, we're going to, we're never going to get out. We're going to drown. You know, we're going to go down the rabbit hole and get stuck. Um, Yes. Yes. And you don't want to get stuck there. And, you know, I think it's so interesting also, first of all, I love that dream and I think it's, we need to help it, that happen. So we'll have to talk about this off uh, the air, but because I think it's really important when we're, we're not focused on this and now at a time where the collective grief, we're all feeling it, it's so intense, but I thought it, I think it's so interesting what you said about the shaking because I actually did do that. It was almost like I went in shock and like almost, Five days later, when I'm packing up my mom's stuff, I had that happen in it. It felt like I mean, my teeth were chattering. I was shaking and I had a friend with me. I, it was very intense. But th- yesterday, uh, this is th- the day before yesterday. This is silly, but I went outside. I live in the country in Virginia, as we were saying earlier. And I went outside to do something with my chickens. And I am just sort of scared of snakes. I'm a big fat baby when it comes to snakes. And I went to get something and I realized that it was a chicken, a laying box. And I went to move it and there was a gigantic, in my head, I, I don't know how big it really was, snake in it, in un, underneath the box. And all I saw was a big black coil and it scared the heck out of me. And I ran out. And then what I did was I just screamed three times and I thought, okay, what are you doing? But it felt like it helped me get rid of some of that scary energy. I, I, it, 
And I thought, oh, and not, I still was scared and I'd left the eggs in there and snakes love eggs. So I actually had to walk back in there and get the eggs. But I've become braver these days as my husband's dealing with dementia. So normally I would be like screaming for my husband to deal with it. But uh, yeah. you can deal with it yourself, Deborah. Yeah. But so I think that's fascinating, that point. And once again, Patty, we don't know anything about this stuff. How can we not know how to grieve for loved ones and for loss and for what's happening in our country? And what do you mean what's going on in Portland? What do you mean the school shootings all... Patty, we're not doing anything about this. Why? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think something you had said earlier, too, about helping people die. I, I, I You didn't say about helping people die. Like, I can't remember what you said, but it made me think about something that I say a lot. Honoring the death. Our body knows how to die. And honor, right. Honoring because we have this idea of we need to keep people alive. You know, and so our medical system is set up to keep people alive. But where's the conversation about dying with dignity and helping people die? I mean, we're all going to die. I mean, right. and it's like our biggest fear. Death and taxes are all going to happen, but we, you know, we, we want to avoid both of them. But, you know, we're all going to die. None of us are immortal, right? It's like, where's the conversation around conscious dying and i do know some people who are doing that kind of work but it's a very small pocket of of people because we so focus on keeping let's keep them alive let's right. keep them alive keep whether them alive. or not it makes sense i remember when my father was dying they um they were going to put you know they were going to incubate him and blood. and i thought what are we doing why are we torturing him and he wasn't in a state where he could really give you his opinion but i knew his opinion because he was my father and so i and i didn't want my father to die but i also didn't want to torture him in keeping him alive and i had a friend of mine that lost her son at seven and it was it was so that one of the saddest experience we've ever walked with someone else, three months of experience and they did everything they could to keep him alive. And afterwards she said to me, I wish, I wish we had let him die. And I said, we don't know how to let him die. We don't know how to let our children die. We don't, we're going to do, and we, it's not just our children. We do it to everybody, but we don't know how to do that. I'm not just going to give up. He's seven years old, but yeah. Yeah. And it's always both. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I, again, we want to pick a side sometimes, you know, keep them alive, let them die. It's both. And, you know, of course we want to do everything we can to keep them alive because that's, you know, that's what we do. Seven, losing a child at seven is, you know, a child grief is hard. That's really hard and it's all hard, but you know, um, so yeah, and I watched a dear friend of mine um, die shortly before my partner died and uh, at a hospital here that was a research hospital. And so their agenda was to keep her alive, to continue to research. She had several surgeries, heart surgeries, lung surgeries, and th the final week before they finally pulled all the plugs, she was all hooked up to everything, you know, kidney, lungs, everything. And um, my partner and I were in there and I thought he was going to like strangle the doctor because mm -hmm. he was in agreement with me as well of, of conscious dying with dignity. And the doc comes in and says, Marva, do you want to keep trying? Do you want us to keep trying to keep you alive? The doctor actually said that to him and she can't talk because she's innovated and she goes, mm -hmm. you know, oh, and God. I thought again, my partner was going <laughs> to take this doctor out. And we both agreed that neither one of us ever want to have that experience. You know, um, why? Why? And so finally, they, the family decided and they all surrounded her and peacefully, you know, and that's what my partner also said to her husband was, you know, I've learned because he had lost his wife and he was a, a practitioner in the Science of Mind Church and a very spiritual um, incredible human. Okay. And he said, you know, sometimes, so sometimes we have to give our loved ones permission. We have to tell them it's okay because they hold on for us. Right. And that's the grace when we talk about the topic today, transforming fear, grief and fear into love and grace. And that's what he was writing about before he died. And I'm continuing his legacy by, you know, the work that I'm doing um, in the book and also a course that I'm creating called, with that same title. Because what he found was the profound depth of love that is actually what we call grace when we 
lose someone that we care about, the depth of our love is the depth of our grief. So, you know, when we can feel the depth of our grief, we're actually feeling our love. Um, and then there's this idea that we're never alone, that they're still always with us in some way. Right. Um, I, believe, I believe. Even Kamala said last night in her acceptance speech, I know my mom's watching watching me here. I mean, we, we say that lightly, uh, you know, and, and in various contexts, but that to me is the grace. Because if, if I didn't believe that my father and my partner and my friend Marva and all the other people I've lost in my life um, weren't with me. Right. You just I, go on. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe that we're all connected and there's all always a sense of um, grace in that connection. I agree. And I've had, uh, I had a show, um, it's been about a year ago, um, on palliative care, end of life, um, with a woman named Shoshana. And it was a really beautiful, because why can't we honor death? Let's just honor it. It's, you know, and I also want to say that when my father, and I love my father, and when my father was dying, my father was really afraid to die. He got lung cancer. He survived it for 10 years. And he had many almost, he almost died experiences. And at the end, when we knew he was going to die and he was incubated and we were going to have to unplug it, the nurse said to me and my sister, um, okay, well, well, what we're going to do is we're going to wake him up because he'd been in a coma for two weeks. We're going to wake him up and we're going to take the tubes out. And I was like, no, don't wake him up. I don't want daddy to know that we're going to kill him. I mean, you know, irrational. And she's like, no, 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 it won't work like that. It, because I didn't want him to be afraid and I didn't want him to know, you know. Yeah. And so when they did it, he he my uh, he actually was in a really beautiful place i mean he and he didn't die right away and it wound up being a really beautiful miraculous experience it was hard it was hard but i as you said patty we learn the most from the hard times if yeah. we'll let ourselves and so the not talking about these topics not talking about the collective grief and what to do and one thing that i'm going to do i promised to the audience Patty, I'm going to have you send us the link to all of your books and to the courses and the thing that you're doing with your daughter as well, because we need to give people resources. We're not, we, we're like, I was blessed to have Doug, my, you know, one of my dearest friends who's, a, you know, is in the field walking me through it, but he was walking me through it. I mean, he was on the phone with me constantly because we live in different states, but it's, you know, that we have a collective grief and we're not dealing with it and people are traumatized. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's very scary, that fear of death, because it's the, we have a fear of the unknown and aren't we in the unknown and the uncertainty? <clears throat> Excuse me, what's going on right now? I mean, I think that's the big fear because we like to be... We humans think that we can control our lives. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm always disappointed to realize how much control I don't have. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. It's really about letting go of control, and that's what dying is about, and we don't know. And I had a dear friend who died of breast cancer last year after, gosh, she had it a long time, like six, seven, maybe even eight years, yeah. and yeah. she had been an atheist, and it was funny because she was a really good friend of mine. We were part of a mom's group when our kids were little, and and she was a scientist and I was a spiritualist, you know. And we would have great conversations, not debates. We really respected each other's opinions. But she was science and I was spirit. And so when she found out, you know, she had cancer and she had to face that idea of dying, she was terrified. And the reason she became an atheist is because she was raised in a family where you feared God was the, you know, punishing father. Yeah, so I don't decided, want a God like that. Yeah. She decided there wasn't, there that, that wasn't her God. But then when she was faced with dying, it was the fear, like you're talking about, it's, well, what if that's true? And so um, she and I had a lot of conversations about that. And she actually started reading books about near-death experiences and, and more spirituality, but she never re really like completely came over <laughs> to the depth of what I believe, not that I think anyone should, because I think everyone's beliefs are personal, but but she was more because I don't I'm not afraid to die at all. I'm afraid of the pain in the process, but right, right, right. It's how I'm gonna die, I worry about, but dying, yeah, I'm I'm just fine. a blink, right? It's just a yeah. just a piece of it all. Right. So 
but so many people are so afraid. So anyway, when right before she died, she was living in um, Maryland, actually, and I was here in Colorado. And I pulled a card from, I have a, 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 a inspirational deck with about mother, messages from Mother Mary, right? And I said, Aww. I know you don't really believe in this stuff, but I want to read this card to you. And it was so beautiful. It was about trusting and loving ourselves. And she said, you know, I don't know if I believe in God, but if there is a God, I hope it's a she like that. <laughs> I agree. I hope it's a woman too. <laughs> well, you know, I also want to talk about that. And I know we're running out of time, but because I want to make sure I get you off on time. But um, I know that, you know, my, I've talked about this on air. My daughter has Down syndrome and she lost multiple friends with disabilities as she was growing up. And, and you gave that beautiful example of your daughter crying, but what do we, what should we be telling our children? I don't think we're prepared. We're not preparing adults and we're certainly not preparing children for these conversations. And, and children know something weird's going on. There's an evil, scary, invisible COVID-19 virus out there, but you know, what, what should we be telling our children? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my daughter and I had talked a lot about that because it's such a good question because it is scary. And I think the main thing is to validate the feelings. All feelings are okay, but all behavior isn't. So when our kids come to us and they say, I really miss my friends, you don't want to talk them out of that and say, oh, but you know, we've got, we've got plenty to do in the house. You, you know, just get over it. You know, we're going to say, I know right. you really miss your friends. It's really hard, isn't it, to miss your friends? Right. And the virus, so they say something like, well, that what's the virus? It's, I'm scared of the virus, you know? They need to know that you're gonna protect them and keep them safe, but we don't wanna talk them out of their feelings or minimize their feelings. And I think that's the thing that we've learned about child development now, you know, up until the age of seven or eight, they can't tell fantasy from reality. So the scary monster out there, it, it, they can make up all kinds of things in their in their mind. and of what this virus is. So we really need to talk to kids on their level. I think the biggest injustice we do is, and so many people do this, especially with death and dying with kids. You know, I, I don't know how many stories I've heard of uh, parents who were dying when children were small, but they no one told the child that they were dying because they didn't want to upset them right. until they actually died. And then... <laughs> Then they try and smooth that over too, like with my dad. So we have to stay. He's in a better place, Patty. You should be happy. Yeah, I'm we not have to stay I'm really in, dialogue, not. in dialogue the whole time, and all feelings are okay, and give kids permission to, you know, to cry and and be sad. And I think that we we don't like sadness in our culture much. We think yeah. we actually there's a lot of shame around sadness. You know, you're yeah, depressed. That's true. You, yeah, you to get over you're it. Broken. You're broken. Right. You're broken. I know that we're running out of time. So let me give you, I, I want to give you the last, you know, to, few minutes to talk about it and also make sure that um, even though we will put all of this with your episode, but tell people how to find you, Patty, how to find your books, how, and also, you know, let me give you the last, um, the last few minutes to comment about your work too, which I just love your work. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Deborah. It's been a delight talking with you. I, um, you know, on so many levels, feel um, a kindredness. So I appreciate that. I agree. I think you um, you have to be my friend. Don't make me stalk you. So uh, because we, it feels like we're friends already. So okay, good. <laughs> yeah. I um, my website is pattyashley.com. So it's Patty with an I, P A T T I A S H L E Y. It has everything on it. Um, the courses that I'm doing, the first one I created was called Go In, Not Out. And I did that when we were in quarantine because I felt like it's an opportunity for people to slow down and spend some time alone or in their homes with their you know, loved ones, but not having distractions of going out and, and you know, being busy. We stay so busy. So, so some, some, um, PowerPoints, uh, videos, worksheets, meditations, some tools and some ideas of what it means to really go inward and find, you know, parts of ourselves that we may have not um, remembered. Right. Then the other course is Moms in Real Life that I did with my daughter, Elizabeth Ashley Herman, who's a school psychologist and a parent coach and a mom, and of course, my precious daughter. Um, and that was fun because she did a whole PowerPoint um, called Screen Time 
screen time. So talking about, you know, how kids are on the screen and how there's um, so much um, emotion going on and how to help maneuver that. So again, PowerPoints, videos, worksheets, meditations. And then the third course that I keep putting off the launch date because I want it to be really special is this one, the transforming grief and fear into love and grace. So hopefully that'll be coming out in the next month or two. Um, and my books are all on my website too, all three okay. books. You can click the Amazon link. Also sign up to do work with me online. If you want to do authenticity architecture um, online, I can do that. And yeah. So are you on social media? I am. And so every Friday at 11, I'm doing a Facebook live. Um, promoting the new book right now and going to have some guests coming up in September who, you know, work with people around shame. One of my dear um, musician friends here, Rebecca Folsom, does vocal freedom and helps people express themselves through their voice. I've heard of her too. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's amazing. I recommend D um, Doug Foresta because okay, he's Doug. Been doing a lot of courses for the Daily Ohm now. So um, right. he's brilliant, brilliant. So, right. Um, well, Doug will definitely do that. Um so yeah, Friday at 11, I'm not do I'm not going to be on tomorrow because I'm attending another um, training, but, uh, yeah, going forward every Friday at 11 mountain time, you'll see me on Facebook. So I'm on, I, yeah, I'm on all the social media, Facebook. I'm not great with Instagram. I'm still learning it. Um, I have a YouTube channel, lots of videos that I've done are on YouTube. Okay, good, good. I'll get you to send me all the links and we'll make sure the audience knows it. And also... I would love to have you and your daughter come on and let's continue the discussion. So we'll talk about that offline as well, but I think that would be very helpful for the audience. So Patty, thank you for all of your work. And I'm so sorry for all the losses that you, you know, have recently. Uh, that's so sad losing your, um, you know, your partner like that, but he went out real fast. So good for him too. <laughs> but yeah, that's the way he wanted it. And that's the way I want it too. So <laughs> right. it's just sort of shocking for those that love him. But right. thank you so much, Patty. And I so appreciate the audience. And let me know if you want us to do different topics, but we definitely will talk Patty and her daughter to come back on because I think that would be very interesting. So thank you to everybody that supports the work that we're doing. And Patty, thank you so much for all your work. Mm -hmm. So thank talk to everybody next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.